Signore e signori, signore e signori, buonasera, buonasera, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò della New York University. My name is Stefano Albertini, I'm the director of the Casa. It's a great pleasure to welcome here tonight uh, the members of Save Venice and the members of the Casa. For those of you who are here for the first time, I assume that you're interested in Italian culture, therefore take a look at our website and if you're interested, please join the mailing list. All our events are free and open to the public. We don't talk only about Venice, but we talk about a bit of everything that has to do with Italy, both in the past, in the present, from music to economy to politics and everything else. Uh, we are delighted of this ongoing collaboration with Save Venice that has been going on for more than four years. And I was just mentioning to our friends here that uh, our founder, Baroness Zerilli Marimont, the casa is named after her, was also an enthusiastic uh, supporter of Save Venice and she felt very much in tune uh, with the mission of Save Venice. So for us here at the Casa, it's also a particular uh, sense of uh, continuing in some way uh, her way of intending uh, cultural patronage, philanthropy, and the preservation of, the, of our cultural heritage. And without further ado, I would like to ask uh, the chairman of Save Venice to introduce tonight's speaker. Please welcome Frederick Ilkman. Buonasera. Benvenuti a tutti. I'm Frederick Ilchman. I am the chair of the Art of Europe Department at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. So I'm a museum curator, but uh, my real passion is the cause of, say, Venice and the culture of Venice. So it is my pleasure as chairman to introduce Patricia Fortini Brown tonight. She is my esteemed colleague on the board of directors of, say, Venice, also on the projects committee, uh, which tries to determine which art restorations and architecture restorations should be our priority. But I'm also, very happily to say, a former student of Patricia Fortini Brown and a big fan. She is Professor Emerita at Princeton University and a renowned scholar of the social and cultural history of the Italian Renaissance. She has a number of areas of research she's worked on for a long time, including Venice in the 15th and 16th centuries, women and the family in Renaissance Venice, and the artist Carpaccio. And she's considered by all in the field a true superstar. And those of you who have not heard her speak, you are in for a treat. She began teaching at Princeton in 1983 and served as chair of the Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton from 1999 to 2005. She retired in 2010 and has never been busier. Among, among her best known books are Venetian Narrative Painting in the Age of Carpaccio, which is a classic, Venice and Antiquity, and Private Lives in Renaissance Venice. You see the pattern here, Venice, Venice, Venice. She's currently working on two more books. One is The Venetian Bride, which is a microhistory centering on the marriage of a Friulian noble, Girolamo della Torre, and Giulia Bembo. She was the daughter of a noble Venetian family. So that's her micro history project. And then she's doing a larger book tentatively titled Venice Outside Venice, that dealing with the artistic and cultural geography of the greater Venetian dominions of the Venetian empire. Uh, she's not only a preeminent scholar and teacher, also consider her a great friend. I had the pleasure of traveling with Pat and actually another person in this room uh, two years ago, a Save Venice patron trip. And I must say that this esteemed professor looked very much at home and very elegant in a traditional kimono. <laughs> After the talk, we will have a Prosecco toast upstairs. And there is material about Save Venice upstairs. And we'll be back here in the Casa Italiana, Zerili Merimo, on March 20th with a lecture by a member of our office in Venice, Melissa Kahn, talking about the restoration of Carpaccio's St. Ursula cycle. But right now, it's not about Prosecco. Instead, the lecture is about water, and the topic is the aesthetics of water, wellhead cisterns and fountains in the Venetian Dominion. Professor Patricia Fortini Brown.
thank you, Frederick, for a lovely introduction. And uh, I have to say, Frederick uh, took my graduate seminar when he was a sophomore and was really fully right up to speed with all of the graduate students and even beyond. And I thought, where did this person come from? <laughs> it was like he arrived in art history fully formed and has gone. He went on and did, did his PhD at Columbia with the wonderful David Rosand. So uh, you know, we're all very proud of Frederick. Uh, full disclosure, this is a version of uh, a kind of an advanced version of a talk that I gave at the National Gallery uh, in Washington last year and at the Cosmos Club in Washington. Let's see if I can find where things are located here. When we think of Venice, we think of water, a city in the sea, a group of islands surrounded by water. And yet therein lies a paradox. As the Venetian diarist Marine Sunudo once wrote, Venice is in the water and has no water. No rivers, no springs, no source of fresh water other than the rain from heaven or barges from the mainland. Sunudo remarked for further, and it is truly a joke living in the water and having to buy it. Were it possible to make fountains here, I think that no city in the world would equal Venice. Indeed, Canaletto's painting shows the city's main piazza without a fountain, unusual in that period. And in fact, treatises on and imaginary images of the ideal city envisioned a fountain as the focus of the city center. But the Venetians had to build a city without running water, and they learned early on how to capture this precious natural resource. Since the groundwater was not drinkable, they could not drill proper wells. So they devised an ingenious system of water recovery that is hidden beneath almost every compo, cloister, and courtyard in the city. First, a basin around four meters deep would be scooped out of the island mud and lined with a thick layer of clay that kept out the salt water. Then a well shaft of brick or stone perforated at the bottom was placed on a slab in the center. The clay, the clay basin was then filled with layers of sand and topped with paving stones or bricks. Rainwater was channeled from roof gutters through downspouts or fell directly onto the squares where it trickled into drains embedded on the sides and percolated down through the sand into the cistern at the bottom of the well shaft. And the filtered water was then pulled up to the surface in buckets. And what we see is this. The wellhead with the cistern under the pavement is called a pozzo, and the receptacle on top, a ve vera da pozzo. But we'll stick with the English term wellhead instead. During periods of drought, when insufficient rain uh, fell to meet the city's needs, water workers called aquaroli uh, would row large flat bottom barges to Lisa Fusina on the mainland at the edge of the lagoon. There, they loaded potable water from the Renta River into their barges by means of a water wheel, a geared mechanism that gives meaning to the term horsepower. <laughs> Returning to Venice with their barges filled with fresh water, the Aquaroli uh, made their rounds to the wells throughout the city and poured the water into the cisterns or sold it directly. The purity of the public cisterns was protected by the authorities. As shown in Canaletto's painting, the wells had wooden or metal covers locked at night and opened every morning by the parish priest or by his representative at the ringing of the church bells. Water was also sold in small quantities along the streets by water sellers called bigolanti who brought fresh water directly to homes and shops upon request. With the wellhead, we see where necessity provided an opportunity for self-expression self and civic beautification. As the inscription on the wellhead in Campo San, San Leonardo states, for the convenience of the people as well as an ornament of the city, in sum, utility and aesthetics. The wellhead was a place of encounter, and as such, it was arguably the most important piece of sculpture in the everyday life of Venetians. Not only a place to fetch water, but also to socialize with the neighbors. 
As we walk through the winding streets of Venice, we still encounter an astonishing variety of wellheads, centerpieces of nearly every public campo and private courtyard. During the Renaissance, there were 7, 000, around 7,000 of them. Since Venice had no stone of its own, all the wellhead material, primarily marble or limestone, had to be boated in from elsewhere. Venetians were masters at repurposing antique remains, and early on the archaeological wellhead was made from genuine Roman or Greek spolia. The hollowed out shaft of the Corinthian column, probably brought in from the mainland near Aquileia, once capped a cistern in front of the church of Santa Fosca on Torcello. I mean, it's still there, but the cistern is not used. Two more, now in the Museo Archeologico, were probably spoils from the Fourth Crusade, when Venice joined the French in capturing and looting Constantinople. One fashioned, that you see here, from a Corinthian capital of Proconesian marble, and the other, crafted from a votive altar decorated with Bucrania, rosettes, and swags, and bearing a Greek inscription. Most of the wellheads carved ex novo from blocks of stone were less elaborate. Indeed, some were very plain, strictly to supply water, like the generic wellhead in Corte del Milion, where Marco Polo is thought to have lived. But even humble wellheads need love. And the Boston chapter of Say Venice recently restored this one, not to its former glory, that rim, rim worn down from years of use as part of its history, but to stabilize it and lessen some of the ravages of time. The grime was removed from the base, and perhaps most importantly, the graffiti scrubbed from the lid, and it's now ready to anchor the courtyard for another 500 years. But now let's go back to the beginning and look at the development of wellheads over time. The earliest surviving purpose-made wellheads are, are hollowed out cubes or cylinders of marble or limestone and date to the 8th to the 10th century. This is sometimes called the Carolingian period, when Venice thought, fought off the Frankish kings and embraced Byzantium. One of the most common decorative motifs was a large cross flanked by stylized leaves and set beneath an arch, an ensemble called the life-giving cross in Byzantine texts. It's been suggested that these crosses were apotropaic, ensuring the purity of the water in the cistern and the health of those who drank it. And beyond that, that they had political resonance, linking Venice's salvation to the Byz Byzantine Empire. Indeed, the interlace pattern with flowers and rosettes on the left-hand side of the V&A wellhead uh, is strikingly similar to the Palastri Acritani, looted from Constantinople after 1204 and installed on the south side of San Marco. It's not that this was a model in Venice because that, uh, that predates, the wellhead predates it, but it's the same kind of, of uh, decorative vocabulary. By the 12th century, during the Romanesque period, the wellheads featured an amalgam of Western Byzantine and Islamic elements. This example combines the cubic and cylindrical shapes of the earlier period by enclosing a drum within a framework of arches supported by columns. The animal and vegetal, vegetal motifs on the drum are similar to the Veneto-Byzantine formelle, reliefs that still, one still sees embedded high on walls of Venetian palaces. Indeed, the style and iconography of wellheads was often reflected in architectural sculpture in Venice at large. As with the arches shared by this wellhead and Kabarzitsa on the Grand Canal. And we're looking at the shape of these, uh, these arches here. By the 13th century, the pointed Gothic arch was beginning to replace the round-headed Byzantine. And we see both in the slightly, inflect, slightly inflected Gothic arches tucked under a round-headed arcade on this square wellhead in Campio, Campiello del Remer. The Gothic arches replicate the windows of the Piano Nobile of Count Leon Morosini behind it. In the 14th century, a shape that melded circle and square emerged to become the most common type. 
It consists of a slightly tapered cylindrical drum topped by a squared off cornice with hanging arches on each side and scooped out corners. We see it in every sestiere in Venice, but with subtle differences. In Calle, uh, de, Calle del Tomasi in San Polo with extended archivolts. In Corte Bolani in Castello with shallow archivolts. Repurposed as a table at Hotel Al Ponte Mocenigo in Santa Croce. <laughs> in Campo San Sebastiano in Dorso Duro with Islamic archivolts, in Corte Mazor in Dorso Duro with rosettes all around, and in the ghetto in Canareggio and in Corte Canal in Dorso Duro with a rosette and a coat of arms on the sides. And in Campo San Vidal, still in exactly the same place that Canaletto recorded it in the 18th century. Canaletto's painting is doubly revealing for it shows us the wellhead in use, as well as the stonemason's yard in which it could well have been made. For those of you familiar with Venice, the President Academia Bridge now spans the Grand Canal right about here. Uh, the mason's yard is long gone. Coats of arms and amphorae were probably the most common decorative motifs on wellheads, whatever their shape throughout the period. Here's an assortment, one from each sestiere of the city from the 13th to the 15th century. And that brings us to another Save Venice restoration, recently completed with a grant from the MKM Foundation. Corte, per Corte per Perini is located off Salizada San Leo in Castello, not exactly on the beaten path. You might wander in here by chance on the way from Rialto to Santa Maria Formosa, uh, or even San Marco or to go to the Osteria I Sconto in the background. As you can see, the wellhead was a badly tarnished jewel in the center of the courtyard. This assortment of details gives you a sense of the bad, sad state of affairs. And if I had to guess, I judge that this courtyard was subject to frequent inundations of Aqua Alta. An unglamorous but painstaking cleaning was carried out. And this is the happy result. Two more views. The water stains near the bottom could not be removed completely, but you'll have to agree that it's an improvement on the original. The most elaborate and original wellheads were usually hidden away in private courtyards of palaces. The human figure in coats of arms, often with personalized imagery that celebrated the family, began to appear on wellheads in the 14th century. Here, a circle of courtly figures, five maidens, four youths, dance hand in hand around this drum-shaped example. The wellhead on the upper right, decorated with the heads of young children, alternating with plumes of foliage, once stood in the courtyard of the house of the painter Jacopo Tintoretto in Cantoreggio, the one on the bottom in Capesero degli Arfe and both were modeled after one of the capitals of the arcade of the south facade of the Palazzo Ducale. Around the end of the 14th century, the Corinthian capital became a favored model for wellheads. The courtyard of Cadoro is dominated by a magnificent piece carved in red Verona marble by Bartolomeo Bone in the 1420s. This is one of the very few wellheads that can be attributed to a specific sculptor and is recorded as having taken 233 days to carve. With one face featuring the Contariti coat of arms, the other three sides are carved with personifications of fortitude, charity, and justice, the most frequent, the most cherished virtues of the Venetian family and the state. And some wellheads resist typology, like this unique specimen carved like a basket in Corte Gregolina near Calle dei Fabri. 16th century wellheads in public squares tended to be simple geometrical shapes, square, round, or hexagonal. They often feature inscriptions and figures of patron saints. For example, the large, this large hexagon decorated with swags of fruit and foliage and a kneeling Saint Francis in Campo dei Gesuiti. 
Only one of the two original wellheads that gave the name to Campo del Dopozzi survives, but they're both commemorated by this relief on one of its panels. But there's, which shows like the two wellheads. Uh, but there's more. The patrons of this wellhead had a sense of place. San Martino and the Holy Trinity are opposite one another on other panels. This religious duality is explained by the fact that the Campo was located between the parishes of Santa Ternita, or Holy Trinity, and San Martino. The iconography of the surviving wellhead thus ce celebrates the history and the geography of the Campo. A new shape for wellheads emerged in the 17th century. Just as the Gothic and Renaissance masons had been inspired by the capitals of columns, the sculptors of the Baroque period were inspired by the baluster. The two massive wellheads in Cantaletto's painting were installed in Campo San Stefano in 1724. They are the robust descendants of the balustrade of Palazzo Loredan on the same Campo. And what is that circle on the wellhead on the right? the Lion of St. Mark, neatly chiseled off in the iconoclastic frenzy that swept through the city at the end of the Republic in 1797. <laughs> but now let's return to the mid-16th century and the two great wellheads in the courtyard of the Palazzo Ducale, recorded by An uh, Antonio Gioli in the 18th century. They were cast in costly bronze, the only ones in the city to replace earlier ones made of stone and they were anything but plain and simple. Carved in a mannerist style that we associate more with furniture than with architecture per se, and created not by stonemasons, but by bronze casters in foundries that specialized in artillery. One wellhead is proudly signed and dated, God, Fortune, Work, Ingenuity. Niccolo di Conti, son of Marco, Venetian, caster of weapons to the most illustrious Venetian Republic, cast this work, 1556. The other wellhead is inscribed simply with the date and the name of the family foundry, Albergetti, 1559. Their decorative arsenal features an exuberant assemblage of grotesque masks, winged cherubs, bare-breasted herms, cartouches, volutes, Moorish strap work, scrolls, and swags of fruit. It's sometimes called the Sansovino style after the sculptor Jacopo Sansovino. Almost as if in competition here, each artisan sought to outdo the other by skillfully employing the vocabulary in a distinctly different way. We find it on stucco ceiling decoration, or on picture frames, or on books on frontispieces, pieces, or on cannons. Where we do not find it is on other wellheads. <laughs> it's just too much. The bronze wellheads made an unapologetic statement of magnificence and civic benevolence. For as Jolie and Carlovaris attest, as you see in the, in, the, in, the, in the images here, they were meant to be used. And yet, notwithstanding their splendor, Venice was still a city without a single fountain of fresh running water. However, it was able to build and appropriate fountains in its larger dominion. Let's go to Brescia, an old Roman city and one of the fur furthest points west in Venice's mainland empire. It was known as the city of fountains with abundant water supplied by three rivers and an aqueduct that dated back to Roman times. It had 47 major public fountains by the end of the 16th century, but we'll look at just one, the Fontana della Palata, depicted in the lower right corner of Rashi Chotti's map and sharing pride of place with the civic loggia on the left. The fortified Torre della Palata, built in part from the remains of Roman buildings, st stood at a major crossroads of the city. In 1597, a new fountain was built at its base. It was designed like a Baroque pediment, complete with volutes, scrolls, and obelisks that serves as a frame for a sensuous triton the fish-tailed sea god and son of Poseidon, blowing water from two conch shell trumpets. Behind him in the, uh, is the coat of arms of the city. At his sides, pilasters decorated with clusters of fruit suspended from leonine corbels. 
He's flanked by the gods of the city's two principal rivers, the Garza and the Melia. Seashells on the pedestal supporting the obelisk complete the aquatic theme. And sitting like a queen atop the Triton's niche is, a figure, is, a, is the figure of Brescia in the armor of Pallas Athene, holding a cornucopia. A medieval relief of San Apollonio, an early Christian bishop who first preached the gospel in Brescia, is in, embedded in, in the wall up to the left. The fountain, shown here in a 19th century painting, celebrates Brescia's Roman and Christian past and its identity as an independent city, even when under Venetian domination, that provides prosperity and abundant water to its citizens. Ironically, Brescia, the city of fountains with abundant water, did not, like Venice, have a fountain in the Piazza della Loggia, arguably the most important square of the city. Two artists sought to redress this defect, not of nature, but of man, by inserting imaginary fountains in the center of the square in paintings made a century apart. Although accurate in most respects as far as the architecture is concerned, the paintings fall into the category of the capriccio, a work of art representing a fantasy or a mixture of real and imaginary features, in this case perhaps examples of wishful thinking. Although most of Venice's terra firma cities were located on rivers or streams and had a stable water supply, the situation was different in Venice's settlements in the Stato do Mar. We find them strung along the Dalmatian coast, that's the pink area there on the map, uh, we find, uh, and, and on the islands of Corfu, Crete, and Cyprus. Venice built waterworks in all these places, but today we'll look only at Crete. Condia, now Heraklion, was the principal city of Venetian Crete. Public wells and uh, uh, pub public and private wells and cisterns were already in use when the Venetians arrived on the island in 1210, but they were insufficient for the needs of the population. So fresh water was hauled in from springs near Kazamba, around 15 meters east of the city. In 1474, the Venetian Senate observed the danger of the situation if the city should fall under siege by the Ottoman Turks and ordered the construction of three large cisterns to be built inside the city with all speed to store rainwater to supplement the water from Kazamba. Private parties were also ordered to restore and maintain their own cisterns. The wellhead, these wellheads now survive only in a museum. I don't think I've ever seen one in, in uh, Heraklion that's still in place, uh, but they're remarkably similar to those in Venice. It was only in the 1550s that the first true aqueduct was built to bring in water from outside the city. It was constructed at the initiative of John Matteo Bembo, the Venetian Capitano of Candia. He was afforded the opportunity to demonstrate his hydraulic skills by constructing a conduit to supply a handsome new wall-type fountain in front of the Augustinian monastery of San Salvatore. A pastiche of antique fragments and 16th century marble reliefs, the fountain celebrated the city's classical roots and Bembo's antiquarian passion with a headless Roman statue of Asclepius on a plinth provided with a spout from which water flowed into an antique sarcophagus. The statue is flanked by the coats of arms of Bembo and of the Duke of Candia, with the friezes at the side featuring the Lion of St. Mark and the arms of six Venetians who filled lesser offices in the city. But despite such efforts, Candia continued to suffer from periodic water shortages. When Francesco Morosini arrived as the new Provedatore Generale in 1625, he was determined to solve the problem once and for all. In collaboration with three engineers, he constructed a new aqueduct to bring in high quality water from springs in the Euctus Mountains uh, south of the city. The water flowed through 15 kilometers of conduits over three major water bridges into channels inside the city walls. These construction drawings, which date to that time, show a remarkable sensitivity to the environment, like a, kind of like a modern environmental impact study. The massive project involved thousands of workers and cost 13,000 ducats, of which 7,000 came from local contributions. It was completed in only 14 months. 
In order to ensure its safe operation, Morosini ordered that anyone who damaged the aqueduct should be severely punished with imprisonment, forced labor, exile, and confiscation of property. <laughs> Needless to say, nothing happened to it. <laughs> the project culminated in the new Morosini Fountain in the main square. Zwane Papadopoli, a Cretan who once worked in the Venetian Chancery in Candia, later described it as a most beautiful fountain with a statue of a gigante, a giant, in, in the finest marble, standing on a pedestal, bearing a halberd in his hand and treading on a large dolphin, also in marble. <coughs> Papadopoli's gigante was the figure of, 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 of Neptune holding a triton, triton. Tridents, I'm sorry, <laughs> holding a trident. Neptune is now long gone, and the fountain now consists of an upper basin supported by four lions atop an octagonal pedestal, which stands inside an eight-lobed lower basin atop a three-step base. The water flows from the mouths of the lions into the basin below. In accordance with Venetian twin ideals of convenience plus adornment in its public wellheads, the eight-lobed design was intended to facilitate access as much as possible. Each semicircle allowed five persons to draw water at the same time, 40 in all. The theme of the lower basin is a, a marine theosos, Neptune's triumphal entourage of tritons, dolphins, nymphs, and other mythical sea creatures. The coats of arms of Morosini, of the Venetian doge, of the Duke of Candia, and of his counselors are carved in the center, centers of the eight lobes. And what about those exuberant reliefs? Tritons struggling to restrain unruly hippocampuses or seahorses. Music making nymphs on the left with a violin, on the right with a trumpet. They're Italian in spirit, if not in execution. Where did the sculptors get their inspiration? Almost certainly from prints like those of Marco Dente's engravings after Raphael, which circulated widely even as far as the island of Crete and offered a rich vocabulary of mythological sea creatures enthusiastically reinterpreted with varying degrees of proficiency by the sculptor Tomas Venatos and his brothers. But we shouldn't exclude the ex influence of the flagpole bases in the Piazza San Marco, which the Cretan sculptors would in all likelihood never have seen. But their Venetian patrons would have known them well as appropriate, reference for the, uh, appropriate references for the civic center of Candia, known as the other Venice in the Mediterranean. In his final report to the Venetian Senate, Morosini proudly described the inauguration of the fountain by the Latin archbishop, quote, on the day of our blessed protector, San Marco, the 25th of April, 1628. Papadopoli later wrote, I remember clearly how great celebrations were held in the square. There were crowds of people and merriment and applause for the Provedatore Generale who had built the fountain and had the water brought in from the countryside. Oh, how the city rejoiced on that occasion. Morosini decreed that the water, some 1,000 gallons a day, should remain public and could not be sold to private parties and commemorated the event with his portrait medal featuring an image of the fountain on the reverse. Zeus astride an eagle pours water from an amphora and alludes to the source of the water, Mount Euctus, the legendary burial place of Zeus, whose profile was held to be seen in its ridgeline. The Latin inscription suggests that Zeus now celebrates with flowing water and not with a thunderbolt. For the figure of Neptune, there was by then a long tradition, begun by Montorsoli with his fountain of Neptune in Messina, completed in 1557. It was soon followed by Amanati's fountain for Cosimo de' Medici, Grand Duke of Tuscany in Florence, and that was still underway, when John Bologna completed another one in Bologna, this of bronze. The figure's contraposto stance suggests that he was the direct model for the Neptune on Morosini's fountain, if the metal, metal can be considered credible evidence. Returning to Candia and using a little artistic license and Morosini's commemorative medal, let's replace Neptune atop his fountain. As the medal suggests, Zeus or God is the heavenly source of the rainwater that sustains human life. 
The four lion water spouts symbolize Venice's role in making it available to the populace. And Neptune, and Neptune calms the sea, the source of Venice's and Crete, Crete's prosperity. The fountain thus embodied three intertwined themes, the power of God, the power of the sea, and the power of a triumphal Venice. Alas, in 1669, after a 24-year siege, Venice was not triumphant, and the island fell to the Ottoman Turks. They soon converted the nearby Basilica of St. Mark into a mosque and eventually turned the civic fountain into an ablution fountain by drilling holes into the lobes of the lower basin and scooping out indentations in the base to allow for the washing of face, hands, and feet during Muslim prayer and in a sense turned the old Venetian civic center of Candia into the courtyard of the mosque. Now let's return to Venice in the 18th century, where water was still being hoisted up in buckets from cisterns beneath the courtyards or brought in by barges. Repeated attempts had been made to drill proper wells over the years, all without producing drilling, drinkable water. An aqueduct under the lagoon was first proposed in the 15th century and again in the 16th, 17th, and 18th. Nothing happened. Finally, a railway bridge was constructed across the lagoon in 1841 to 46, linking Venice to the mainland. The engineer, Ignazio Michele, proposed at the time that an aqueduct could be built using the new bridge and culminating in Piazza San Marco with a grandiose fountain crowned by a personification of Venus atop a rocky mountain. There is, he wrote, no more pleasant spectacle than water gushing in great masses, and such an edifice would join utility to decoration. The ancient and magnificent square in Venice, so rightfully praised everywhere, would acquire a novel and worthy adornment. In 1880, a French company finally undertook the project and in less than four years constructed an aqueduct 16 miles long to bring water from the Brenta River into the great Sant'Andrea cistern near Piazzale Roma. It's still there. I think I've heard, read somewhere that they're taking it down because they're not using it anymore. <laughs> the project was completed in 1884 and celebrated in a public inauguration by the erection of a fountain in front of San Marco. A modest, but alas, only temporary version of Michaela's project of four decades earlier. For a moment in time, Marine Sunudo's wish was fulfilled. Were it possible to make fountains here, I think that this, no city in the world would equal Venice. Piping was laid under bridges and pavement, and water eventually flowed out of spigots inside houses and in or near the old wellheads. As the wealthier classes transitioned to running water, many of their elaborate wellheads went into public space to be enjoyed by rich and poor alike. This elegant example once adorned the central courtyard of Ca Cornere della Ca Grande on the Grand Canal. It was moved, complete with its base, to Campo San Giovanni e Paolo in 1884 and fitted up with a proper water spout. The wellhead itself was no longer for the convenience of the people, but still for the ornament of the city. Other wellheads became collector's items traveling the world. Two modest pieces ended up behind the art museum on the Princeton campus, and a more impressive late medieval example is in the Cleveland Museum of Art. Four fine specimens found their way to the Victorian Albert Museum in London. And a ninth century wellhead of gray, gray limestone ended up in the garden of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Decorated with guilloche work, lozenges, and stylized vine leaves, it was accurately described as an old Byzantine wellhead repaired. <laughs> Mrs. Gardner purchased it during one of her last visits to Venice from an antique dealer in 1899 for 750 lira. This was a year's income. This was a year's income for a typical working class family of that period in Milan, with both husband and wife working full time. <laughs> Other wellheads went to California. The newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst purchased this large piece in Verona in 1900 and gave it to his mother, Phoebe Apperson Hearst. 
She displayed it prominently at the entrance to her Pleasanton country estate, which she named La Hacienda del Pozo de Verona. <laughs> After Phoebe's death in 1919, the wellhead was moved to the Hearst Castle at San Simeon and placed on the South Terrace. There it was joined by an impressive collection of other wellheads. One conveniently fitted up with a bucket suspended from an antique column of blue-green Cipollino marble. Yet other wellheads found their way to the Museum of Fine Arts in Budapest, where they line the sides of the Renaissance Hall. But some of these wandering wellheads were too good to be true. If originals were not to be had, counterfeiters set out to fill the void. This fine specimen is carved from pink Verona marble with elaborate relief decoration featuring palmettes and intertwined acanthus scrolls, motifs that have a long history going back to the 12th century. But the wellhead is not medieval at all. It was carved in a Venetian workshop in the late 19th century for the export trade and not for domestic use. Nor was Peggy Guggenheim immune from the lure of the fake. This wellhead, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, decorated with Romanesque motifs in the Garden of the Guggenheim Collection in Venice is also an artful forgery made in the same period. Replicas of the finest wellheads saw, uh, wrought by Venetian artists of an earlier time were also available by mail order from this 1916 catalog. <laughs> On the left, smaller versions of the massive wellheads in the courtyard of the Palazzo Ducale. On the upper right, a reproduction of the wellhead in Campo San Giovanni e Paolo. And beneath it, a replica of one of the archeological wellheads made from a Corinthian capital. All were available in terracotta or for a price in marble or Istrian stone, but not in bronze. Sargent used one of these creative anachronisms, inspired, I think, by the Ducal Palace wellheads, as a stage prop for his portrait of the architect Richard Morris Hunt on the right. In the 1880s, Hunt had designed, uh, had designed Biltmore House, a 250-room French Renaissance chateau in the Blue Ridge Mountains for George Vanderbilt. The two men traveled together throughout Europe and Asia, purchasing paintings, porcelains, bronzes, carpets, tapestries, furniture, and this brand new wellhead to furnish the property, reputedly the largest private residence in America. But originals are still to be had. This fine example would have been yours for little more than $10,000 at a Christie's sale in London in 2012. And that brings us to two beautiful wellheads in the garden of the Cosmos Club in Washington, which I was asked to look at. I'm not an expert on this at all, but I became an immediate expert. Now, right around the time that Hearst, Vanderbilt, Guggenheim, Gardner, and the Hungarian nobility were purchasing their wellheads in Venice, Mary Scott Townsend was completing the renovation of her, mas her mansion on Massachusetts Avenue. Two Venetian wellheads would be the ideal feature to embellish the garden. So, are they genuine antiques, or are they too good to be true? Again, I can't pretend to be an expert. I have to conclude that this very handsome piece does seem to be too good to be true. The top is in pristine condition with no chip corners or grooves from ropes pulling up the water buckets. Of course, it could have been artfully repaired, but I don't think so. While it was fitted up uh, at one point with a water pipe to function as a fountain, the chisel marks inside the drum suggest that it was never used for drawing up water. The decoration appears to me to be an extremely skillful recombination of motifs, mainly from 11th and 12th century wellheads and decorative reliefs. Again, here, on, uh, there on the right. Uh, one correction, the camera angle distorts the shape of the Cosmos Club wellhead on the right. It's actually a real cube shape, uh, inspired by medieval models, such as those on the left. But it, what is different is that it is of a piece and not a drum inside a framework of arches supported by columns that you see here on the, on the left. In fact, it bears similarities to this cube-shaped piece in the Museum of Fine Arts in Budapest, which is a 19th century pseudo-medieval fake. Well, the decorative vocabulary, and, and interestingly, these were featured in their catalog 100 years ago of being absolute, absolutely authentic, but they, it's been de-authenticized in recent years. 
while the decorative vocabulary of the arches, columns, and uh, ornamental banding is quite different, the combination of leaves, birds, and animals on the reliefs inside the arches is strikingly similar. As it's the smooth top and rounded cornice of the Budapest wellhead, which shows no signs of wear or tear. And here again are those stylized leaves and reliefs of birds, quadrupeds, and serpents on Peggy Guggenheim's drum-shaped wellhead, ostensibly medieval, but actually 19th century. Both wellheads are, in my view, beautiful impostors. But what about the other Cosmos Club wellhead? Again, in my opinion, uh, this is the genuine article. As we might suspect from those holes bored in the top, we're looking at a piece that once had a lid like this, for example that protected the water drawn up from a cistern beneath the pavement. The refined decorative vocabulary of leafy grapevines, burn, bird, birds, and urns suggests the workshop or influence of Pietro Lombardo or his son Tullio as on this pilaster in the Santo in Padua on the right. And I have to thank Sarah McHam for help with this because she's the real expert on, on this type of carving. And similar to this wellhead in Budapest on the right, authentically Renaissance for a change that has the form of a capital. But the Cosmos Club wellhead has another curious motif, leafy human faces on the corners of the octagon that look like bosses on the vaults of medieval cathedrals. These were also characteristic of Lombardi as on the reliefs in the Church of Santa Maria Miracoli, Miracoli on the top and in the Arca di San Antonio on the bottom. And uh, again, thank you, Sally. In the last analysis, both wellheads are masterpieces of the carver's art. Both are probably unique, one of a kind, both are highly original. We might think of the wellhead on the top as retro rather than fake. It is not a replica like those offered in the 1916 garden catalog. The one on the bottom is a product of its own time, the 15th century. The one on the top is a product of nostalgia and of the passion for collecting in the Gilded Age. Now we've seen the vast aquatic reach of the Venetian Empire, extending from Brescia in the west to the island of Crete in the east, and eventually in museums and stately homes throughout Europe and the United States. Venice's political empire and its own Gilded Age may have ended in 1797, but we might conclude that Venice, the city without water and without a proper fountain in the Piazza San Marco, had nonetheless Triumph, triumphed over adversity and made the entire world its virtual dominion. Thank you.